from top secret test sites to this mysterious island in the Pacific. Today we're going to look at three abandoned and restricted islands. Number 3. Clipperton Island, France Clipperton Island is an uninhabited 2.3 square mile coral atoll in the eastern Pacific Ocean off the coast of Central America. It is 6,634 miles away from Paris, France, but that doesn't mean it's not French. The island was discovered by the Spanish explorer Alvaro Saavedra Cedron in 1528. In 1711, Frenchmen Martin de Chiceron and Michel du Bocage rediscovered it, and about seven years later, France formally laid claim to the island when Napoleon annexed it as part of the French colony of Tahiti. Other countries also claimed ownership of the island, including the United States, whose American Guano Mining Company claimed it under the Guano Islands Act of 1856. Guano, as you might know, is bird and bat excrement that is used as fertilizer. At one point, the AGMC sent a massive workforce to the island. Not one, not two, but three whole people were tasked with taking care of this little piece of paradise and in the meantime, collect as much bird poop as possible. Mexico also got into the battle over Clipperton Island, eventually sending a gunboat in 1897 to occupy and annex it. So to summarize, in the 1800s, the island was claimed by the USA, Mexico and France. In 1914, around 100 men, women and children were living on the island, resupplied every two months by a ship from Acapulco. With the escalation of fighting in the Mexican Revolution, the regular supply visits ceased and the inhabitants were left to their own devices. By 1917, lighthouse keeper Victoriano Alvarez was the last of the men alive. He proclaimed himself king and became a colossal prick. But then he got killed by Terza Rendon, a woman he made advances on, so he didn't cause too much damage. In the end, the last survivors, only four women and seven children, were picked up by the US Navy gunship Yorktown. So that's pretty whack. In 1931, French ownership of the island was diplomatically agreed upon by everyone involved. This island has seen it all really, from military occupation and guano mining, to mad kings, to castaways, to amateur radio expeditions. Clipperton Island has never failed to deliver a good story, and you should definitely read more about it. Oh, okay, 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 I'll, I'll tell you about the castaways as well. In 1962, the MV Monarch, a tuna clipper, sunk near the island for 23 days. Nine of the crew members that managed to make it to land had to survive on coconut water and fish. Since all of the buildings on the island were dilapidated and unsafe, the men had to create their own shelter from cement bags and whatever trash and metal they could find. They were eventually discovered by another fishing boat and a short time later rescued by the US Navy destroyer, USS Robinson. Finally, I guess, finally, I guess I should mention how the island got its name as well. The current name comes from John Clipperton, who was an English pirate and privateer that fought the Spanish during the early 18th century. Some historians claim that he used the island as a base for his raids on shipping vessels. Big, if true. How do you think you would survive on a deserted island for extended periods of time? Would you make it? Comment below. Let me know. Number 2. Bikini Atoll, Marshall Islands In the early morning hours of July 1st, 1946, a select group of US military personnel and press observers witnessed the unbelievable power of Gilda, the 23 kiloton air-deployed nuclear weapon. Well, unbelievable is subjective, I guess, since some of the members of the press were unimpressed to the amount of destruction it caused to the staged ships. 25 days later, another 23 kiloton nuke was detonated, this time underwater. Baker, as the test was called, qualmed anyone's beliefs that nuclear bomb damage would ever be described as unimpressive again. Some of the staged ships were vaporized, and others sunk days later from irreparable hull damage. 
Between 1946 and 1958, the United States detonated 23 nuclear devices scattered across seven test sites on the reef, underwater and in the air at Bikini Atoll. Yeah, that's what we were talking about. Abandoned islands, right? Well, Bikini Atoll is definitely both restricted and abandoned, consisting of 23 islands. Okay, hold on, what, what's up with the number 23? It's come up way too many times now. A a anyway, anyway. Bikini Atoll is a coral reef part of the grander Marshall Islands. The same Marshall Islands, which are part of Micronesia, were relatively isolated for thousands of years. Seriously, it's believed that people have inhabited Bikini Atoll for about 3600 years. The first European contact happened in the 1500s. Since then, numerous countries have laid claim to these islands at one point or another. Currently, only the United States still controls territories in Micronesia. When the US decided to do tests here, they relocated the 40 families, some 167 people, who lived here to nearby islands, like three times. Then in 1970, about 160 Bikini Islanders returned to the atoll after being assured and reassured that it was safe. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. By 1978, the islanders were observed to have an 11-fold increase of cesium-137 body burdens. They were once again relocated to a different island. They also showed low levels of plutonium-239 and plutonium-240 in their urine, which I assume is a bad thing. Eventually, the US Department of Energy stated that all living patterns involving Bikini Island exceed federal radiation guidelines for 30-year population doses. After some lawsuits, in 1986, the islanders received $75 million in damages that was to be held in a trust fund. In 1988, an additional $90 million was appropriated, specifically for radiological cleanup. Most of this money is tied up in trust funds that provide for the food and shelter of the displaced islanders. For example, in 2006, every islander received around $500 cash a year. As of 2016, there were 5,400 living Bikini Islanders, so it's great to hear that even though their land was destroyed, they still managed to survive. What do you think is a fair amount of settlement per person? Comment below with your opinion right now. Number 1. Grignard Island, Scotland there is no exact date of discovery for this island. One of the earliest mentions of it was in the mid-16th century. A Scottish clergyman traveled around the area. He described it as a woodsy island that is only good for fostering rebels and thieves. I'm not sure which island isn't good for that, to be honest. There doesn't seem to be much information about this little 448 acre piece of land. Some records show that in 1881, only six people called it home. By the 1930s, it was uninhabited except for all the sheep. The island was used solely for grazing. So pretty boring so far, right? Q 1942, when British military scientists from the biology department of Porton Down decided that Greenyard Island was the perfect place for a little experiment or two. And by little, I mean huge. The military was investigating the feasibility and usefulness of bioweapons attacks, specifically anthrax. Sir Oliver Graham Sutton, a Porton Down meteorologist, was tasked with conducting the trial. The anthrax strain chosen was a highly virulent type called Volume 14578, named after R.L. Volume, the professor of bacteriology at the University of Oxford who supplied it. Some 80 sheep were taken to the island and bombs filled with anthrax spores were exploded within the vicinity. Naturally, the sheep became infected and began to die within days of exposure. A few of the experiments were recorded on film, which was only declassified in 1997. After all of the tests were completed, the military scientists concluded that a large release of anthrax would thoroughly pollute German cities, ultimately making them uninhabitable for decades. The island too was unable to be decontaminated for decades. Fun fact, if you look at some maps of the UK from that time period, the island was redacted. Things got really interesting in 1981, when newspapers across the country started receiving mail with the heading Operation Dark Harvest. 
The messages continued on with demands that the government decontaminate the island, claiming that certain people had smuggled about 300 pounds of soil from it. They went on to threaten to leave the soil at appropriate points that will ensure the rapid loss of indifference of the government and the equally rapid education of the general public. I have to commend the Scottish for knowing how to threaten politely. Anyway, the group backed up their demands by sending a soil sample containing anthrax to the military research facility at Porton Down. Turns out that the operation was spearheaded by the militant group called the Dark Harvest Commando of the Scottish Citizen Army. A lot of people believe it to be a form of black propaganda, and that the group was never really big or influential. Or a group. Could have been one person for all anyone knows. Since 1981, no one has heard from the group again. After all that drama, the British government finally decided to decontaminate the island in 1986. The process included 280 tons of formaldehyde and seawater solution being sprayed over every inch of Grinard Island and removing the worst contaminated topsoil. The process took four years to complete, and on May 1st, 1990, the island was repurchased for the previously agreed upon price of 500 pounds. Nowadays, after almost 80 years of quarantine and 30 years of disuse, this island is as unwelcoming to visitors as it has ever been. Check out the featured comment below, subscribe for more World on Earth, and I'll see you in the next video.